He not only invented GDP, as you may know, right? And by the way, he was also aware of the limits of the, of the indicator, but he also uh, invented this idea of the Kuznets curve. And this is a very powerful ideological tool for justifying growth. Basically, it says that, yes, there will be some problem as like poor country, you will start to grow. Yes, inequality is way increased. Yes, environmental degradation will take place. But after a point, the turning point on the graph, they will have generated enough wealth to actually take care of those problems. So, theoretically, a super rich country would have zero inequality and zero environmental problems. But unfortunately, uh, this is simply not confirmed by data. And it, it turns out actually that as countries get richer, inequality also grow and they destroy the environment. So, I wish it was true, but no, it doesn't work like that. Then, another type of narrative uh, that Barbara also mentioned is this idea of green growth. And here, uh, it's the idea that somehow with green technology, we will be able to grow and at the same time use less and less resources. This is really the green growth hypothesis expressed here uh, on this graph. But again, I'm uh, obliged to tell you that no, it doesn't work like that. Right? We have no example of a country that actually dematerializes as it grows if you take trade uh, relations into account. And in fact, we're quite far from it. Then in reality, the global use of natural resources keep on growing at high speed. So that's the situation we get by. There's no sign of that green growth anywhere to make it sure. Okay, so not so many interesting stuff there, perhaps, right? Uh, if we are interested in really tackling the problem substantially. How about heterodox economists now? What do they say about this question of like, you know, the link between development and growth? Well, I think there is an increasing number of heterodox economists that will agree that the growth is something that the global north should now tackle. And this is great news, I think. And I think it wasn't like that even three years ago, I would say. It's a new movement, I think, and it's, it's, it's very nice. Even uh, Cambridge economist had a chat here in Utrecht last year at the, uh, the Rethinking Economics Festival. He publicly said at the end, yes, I think we need to go to the global north. And uh, I was very pleased to hear that. Uh, but soon after he said, but this is not at all something that should be applied in the global south, he said. And I think it's, it's a dominant position, I would say, we disagree, uh, among uh, heterodox economists right now. And, uh, and a nice illustration of this position here is this quote by Herman Daly, the grand old man of ecological economics. And he says here, it is absolutely a waste of time, as well as more already backward, to preach ten state doctrines or zero growth doctrines to underdeveloped countries before overdeveloped countries have taken any measure to reduce the growth of their per capita resource consumption. Well, I agree with a lot of that, of course, right? But in my presentation, I will try to show that still. It's possible to qualify this statement, I think. And uh, I think in reality, it's not always so clear cut. Right? That's, that's what we try to show, right? Develop, over develop, uh, disable, disable, and so on. It's not so simple. <coughs> Another narrative that you will find among heterodox economists, uh, uh, post Keynesian, including some Marxists, they, they have championed this idea of the Green New Deal, which is like a massive green growth tradition to renewable energy. Unfortunately, the Green New Dealers, they, re they really problematize the level of consumption. They, they, they rarely say we should like, reduce consumption, otherwise it would be degrowth, right? And this is, this is problematic because uh, huge amounts of fossil fuels would be needed in such a tradition. If you, if you want to have like an entire world at our level of energy consumption, uh, only with like renewable energies. Because with current te technologies, you cannot like generate renewable energy out of renewable energy. 
And so the results are likely to be shorter because the engine of growth will still be there. So yes, you will have a fall in CO2 emission there and so on for some time, but then you would still need you know, more plants once, once your, your imperatives for, uh, for growth have, uh, have taken over. So a lot of green new dealers who are, I would say, metabolically quite naive, and this is always a place, this is very often a weakness among, among uh, these kind of proposals. So one has to be careful about it. Problematize the levels of, uh, of consumption, that's all I'm saying. <clears throat> and now about this question whether it applies only to the global north or if it also applies to the global south and so on. Let's, let's, let's perhaps remember that DGOS is not about shrinking everything indiscriminately, right? It's not about imposing austerity everywhere. There are things that would be consumed more in a DGOS society, like local products or services that would be also produced more. Uh, there are many specific activities that would increase in such a society. It's not about shrinking everything. Like urban gardens, the care economy, the commons, and so on. So the goal is about resizing or downsizing, depending on the case of our use of resources, while at the same time, as Barbara has said it very well, right, organizing society differently. So with more equity, conviviality, and democracy. And if you put it that way, why would, it, why would it only what would it only be a project for the global? I'm saying beyond the term degrowth, but right? I'm talking about the content of it. Okay. How about uh, scholars and activists from the global south? This is a painting by uh, Roy Dominguez, a Filipino artist, and it's, uh, it really represents this, this monster of growth entering the countryside with people resisting against it, with like an army of tracks there on the side and so on. So, first of all, let me just say that, like, because we, sometimes we hear it's an idea from the north and so on, but it would be quite naive to think that only like Westerners have like problematized both, and that the content of the world growth only comes from the north. It's simply not true. Uh, let's take South Asia as an example. Well, Gandhi, he, uh, was well, his model of like uh, a village-based self-sufficient economy is in many ways much more radical than, than what Diego was in Europe would say. Uh, his economist, J.C. Kumarapa, he who is also an economist in himself, and he, his work not only uh, for Gandhi or with Gandhi, but he very explicitly and sharply criticized industrial growth. He, uh, and his writings actually inspired the forefathers of growth in Europe, like uh, Ernst Schumacher or uh, Ivan Illich. Um, let's take the Sri Lankan philosopher Ananda Kumaraswamy, art historian, polymath, and so on. He coined the term post industrial in 1914 already, and post industrialism has immediately its obvious many common point with. Uh, a degrowth uh, project. And he actually defended it. So we immediately see right, that, uh, that this is not just like something that comes from the north. And you can, you can continue. The, uh, the philosopher poet, Rabindran Tagore, uh, could also be seen as a post-growth thinker. He says here, it's a nice quote, I think he says, most of us, and that's in 1924, right? Most of us who try to deal with the problem of poverty think only of a more intensive effort of production. We forget that it brings about a greater exhaustion of materials as well as, as, well as, as, well as of humanity. Multiplying material wealth alone intensifies the inequality between those who have and those who are not, and it inflicts so deep a wound on the social system that the whole body eventually bleeds to death. The Bengali economist Radha Kamal Mukherjee, also a very interesting figure with a very old view, like so far from the current, you know, like reductionist views of contemporary economists. He, he in, in 1938 already, he talks of the balance, the subtle balance between society and ecosystem. 
he coins the term ecological economics, by the way. And he says that the economy must somehow imitate the slow rhythm of nature. So we're totally into this kind of like thinking, right? And today you would have uh, Vandana Shiva who explicitly advocates a uh, uh, Digo's uh, program for India. So, sure, Digo should start in, in industrialized countries. And this is so because the use of resources and the absorption capacity, you know, are, are so so shockingly unsustainable, unsustainable in the world. So that's that's definitely where it would start, it should start. And degrowth in the global north will also contribute to decolonize the global economy and the cultural hegemony of, of the West. But still, this critique of the tyranny of growth certainly also applies uh, to, to, the, to the global south. And you will find many scholars in the literature, critical scholars from the south, who said, you know, it's time to move beyond growthism. And growthism would be a colonial ideology of social progress based on the belief that more market exchange, more market exchange, will mean that more needs happen. It's like this, this linking between market-based exchange and human needs being met. Well, that's something to unpack. <coughs> Let me turn now to uh, a few examples, concrete examples of uh, countries in the global south that could be of relevance to, uh, to the degrowth project. Cuba. Here you have the Human Development Index plotted against the ecological footprint. And as you can see, Cuba is doing better than pretty much everybody else. So Cuba manages to have a very high Human Development Index while being almost at the world capacity level of 2012. So it's almost in the sustainable middle quadrant there, right? But there's no country there, so no country today could be uh, seen as like sustainable, st strictly speaking, if you take the ecological footprint seriously, and there is also criticism on this type of measurement. But still, I think there is some interesting stuff that are going on, right? Vietnam, also uh, doing quite well. Here on this graph, you have 11 social thresholds, they are listed here on the, on the right here, plotted against biophysical thresholds that are transgressed, also listed here. And you can see that uh, Vietnam appears as an outlier here and does a pretty good job. It achieves uh, six uh, social thresholds while transgressing only one biophysical threshold. In comparison, the Netherlands top uh, right, they do well socially, but they just try with all the smaller biophysical uh, thresholds. Note that both Cuba and Vietnam are countries that are ruled by a communist party right now, and I think uh, this can explain their strength also on the, on the social side. <coughs> Costa Rica, not ruled by a communist party. Uh, Costa Rica, also a very interesting example. The, uh, on this Happy Planet Index is this macroeconomic indicator proposed as an alternative to GDP, released every day, I think, and much more holistic than GDP. They look at life expectancy, well-being, equality, and they plot these against ecological impact. And it turns out that Costa Rica tops the global ranking every year. So this country manages to also have a, a high standard of living with very low GDP and minimal pressure on the environment. Again, I'm not saying it's the paradise, I'm not saying they don't have problems, they don't have limits. No, I, uh, don't, don't take me wrong, but I'm just saying there are interesting stuff going on to learn from. How, how is it so? Why do they art for the US so blatantly with less than one-fifth of their GDP? And why the part of Costa Rica where people live the longest and happiest lives, 
according to, uh, to, to the data, the Nicoya Peninsula is also the poorest in terms of GDP per capita. So Jehan Nikel, he tells us that if the Nicoyans do so well, it is not despite their poverty, but because of poverty. Because their communities, environment, and relationships haven't been undermined by industrial expansion. Bhutan, another kind of uh, well known example of a country that tries to do things differently. So they try to develop a new model of like development, they seek sustainability, they seek sufficiency, and that's very interesting sufficiency. That means they, they actually problematize that like they will not grow forever, right? And uh, interestingly, they also invited several eco ecological economists sympathetic to degrowth by by their government. So they invited from Dan Jackson, Tim Jackson, uh, uh, Juliet Shore. Vandana Shiva and others to uh, give them some advice. I'm not saying these ideas come from ecological economics, uh, ecolog ecological economics from the north, not true actually. They, 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 they develop these ideas by themselves, but then they engage in a dialogue with other people. And so here are a few examples uh, of policies that, that limit growth in, in, in some ways. They have this famous new indicator, the Gross National Happiness Index. Also, supposed to replace GDP. It's not fully the case in Bhutan. They still use both indicators. But this GH is like definitely an important tool that they use to guide their policies. They restrict foreign investments. You don't have, for example, fast food chains in Bhutan. Uh, they're not a member of the World Trade Organization. They do not have outdoor advertising. They limit very severely mass tourism. They limit mining. They have free education and healthcare for everyone. They have 50% of the country that is under protected area. And they have in the constitution a mandatory 60% of the country that should be covered by forests. They also said that they are exploring the possibility to shift to 100% agri organic agriculture. So again, not trying to romanticize you know, an exotic country, you know, high in the Himalaya, where everything is fine. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying, well, there are interesting stuff going on out there, right? And they actually, you know, put them into practice to some extent. So what can we learn from that? And more generally, there are many important experiences in the global south today that are of, uh, of relevance to, uh, to, to the to the to the of the post growth agenda. Five degrowth policy action. Like Bhutan, like Cuba focus on needs instead of growth. That's perhaps a, and of course, it's not only valid to the global side. But it's just this basic point, very, very basic point that to boost the undifferentiated growth. You just boost growth, just like that, everything has to grow, like, like you measure it and you see it as a sign of progress, right? It's not the best way to overcome true deprivation when it takes place. And for that, what is needed is like a more collective planning for true needs. This, they need a reflection on, on what, what, what needs do, what are true needs, what are false needs, right? Uh, what is false consciousness and what is really what like fulfills our lives anyway compared to that. And, and it also means less markets only for those who can afford it. Because high growth rates is actually uh, not always good news for the poor. And uh, there are many examples of that. Growth uh, very often actually helps the rich rather than, than the poor. In India, you have like uh, you know, booming middle class or classes enjoying Western levels of consumption and production. But uh, yeah, growth can also be jobless. Very often in the countryside, growth may actually need growth and feeds out of poverty. Because poverty brings cheap art and cheap land. So in no way it goes like overcomes or fight against poverty since it needs it, you know, to, to, to uh, get this uh, 
this this momentum and this really high number again uh, in, in in several countries like like, uh, like like India or even China to some extent. <coughs> And uh, growth may also create new poverty, and this has to be really carefully looked at, right? It can create new poverty through, through forms of accumulation by dispossession, accumulation by contamination, accumulation by qualification. When like services that were previously free, uh, like water, have been commodified, and suddenly people have to pay for it. To cancel external debt and acknowledge ecological debt. The external debt continues to be a, a huge pressure for poor countries and it pushes them more and more into unsustainable extractive activities in, 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 plant in plantation or in mining. And as you can see on the graph here, the debt in the global south in red is still rising and quite dramatically. So. By the way, this is not only the external debt, it's also the national debt, right? So, if you, if you take seriously this, this, uh, this idea that we need to stop uh, the tyranny of growth, we we'll have to have some kind of debt duty. And also, get rid of our monetary system that's actually based on debt, right? But that's another story, you need another presentation in itself to see how this imperative of growth is ingrained in the system. So, in parallel, uh, uh, the ecological debt that industrialized countries have been accumulating since the Industrial Revolution should be taken seriously in one way or another. Rich countries owe the compensation to poor countries for the environmental damage embodied in the world. Right? Think about it. Do you think Bhutan has anything to do with, like, provoking climate change, and yet now they have to face the consequences, they, their glaciers are melting, their source of water is like perishing. There, there is a, a, an issue of global environmental justice there, and I think that with the negative impact of global warming, we will, will, will reinforce this idea of the ecological debt, and we will hear more and more in international negotiations. And this is something Debors uh, would welcome very much. Redistribute. The wealth is already there. I think if you if you want to be serious about the egos, you have to put redistribution at the center. This is also a powerful idea that Barbara mentioned. And because because if you if you take seriously, you know, uh, if you fulfilling need, right, is is, is not necessary. Does not necessarily necessarily need is undifferentiated uh, uh, growth, but a better distribution. Within and between the countries. Take India, for example, again, right? The rich is 10%, they own about 80% of the land. In the Netherlands, the rich is 10%, they have about 70%. So when you see these figures, it's kind of like inappropriate to ask for more growth. Right? The, the wealth is already there. The redistribution could become a substitute for growth, at least for some time, until something else, a post growth society, you can name it, other, in, in different manners that has taken root. Four, extractivism. And here, uh, this post extractivist, uh, post extractivism as a, as a research project, or as an extract, as a as an activist project calls for a move away from economies that are dependent but also guided by this, by uh, extractive industries. And these industries are very often located in the north also. And this is still very much an issue and it's defended by many social movements in the global south uh, with slogans like leave oil in the soil, leave coal in the oil, leave gas under the grass. Or here at this demonstration in Durban 2011. Leave the tar sand in the land. So there would be a social basis behind these kinds of like uh, proposals. <clears throat> and, and that's the last one, right? Around organizing around this idea of the good life. We need to reflect collectively on what is important in our communities. Is it organic food? 
Is it more common, more sharing? The decommodification of public services, like, like Costa Rica has done a, good, a very good uh, job on that. <laughs> keep, keep, uh, keep public services like education or, uh, or healthcare, right? And, and, and what would we need to achieve? What are the implications of the development? There are many cosmologies of philosophy in the South that articulate what constitutes the good life. When the Ubuntu, Kyosei in Japan, the three causes of well being, three Takarata, in Bali, you name it. And very often, these cosmologies they are simply not associated with like, uh, GDP goals. Conclusion my last slide. Um, I'll go back to the initial question. Doesn't development require goals? Well, somebody like Manuela Shiva last year, she actually phrased it the reverse way. She said growth creates poverty. I would say that these five policy lines that I very briefly mentioned, they, they point towards more flourishing without any growth addiction. Aren't the rich only supposed to decode? Again, it's important to remember that the growth is not a punishment. The penalty, right? It's a, it's, it's a project of social and ecological healing that seeks less inequality, more care, right? more conviviality, less impact. And, and in that sense, uh, I, I cannot see why this project would, un, would only be relevant to rich countries. It wouldn't be good for the global south, be another form of colonialism. Well, first of all, as I said, right, it's not just a northern idea. There are many prolongations of, of the same kind of practice, even in the long term, possible degrowth is not good in the global side, right? And what I also wanted to emphasize that there is a lot to learn uh, from us in the global north, from experiences uh, in the global south. Thank you for your time. So let's collect three questions. I think the microphone, the blue computer is there. So raise your hand. And... I'm from PTO, and I've been a long time in India. My question is you say something about um, uh, Gandhi, something about Nana Shiva, I met her several times. How is it possible that in India, with such inspiring persons, that they still go for growth like in the West. Because they are very inspiring uh, example. And then still we see they go and go to the other way, like the like second in the West. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Perhaps if we manage some sort of talk about it, it would also be nice. There also, there are also Brazil 
uh, used to, when I try to, to, uh, to confront these issues, they, uh, most of the time they just refuse the idea of a market. So the solution is kind of, ah, we need to abolish the market. And we do. Abolish the market, to, to, think, to think beyond the market. And is it not a real concrete possibility? So how we can uh, rethink a new association between the economic sphere and the political sphere when we think uh, at the, the growth? Uh, well, these are all very difficult questions. Uh, the India one, I think we have to like historicize it and uh, see that like when India became dependent, it, it, like the, the Canadian ideas were like sidelined, and, and it was more the Peruvian idea of like modernization through very strong state, like that we took over. And then in the 90s, this like kind of like very strong developmentalist state uh, uh, gave place to neoliberalism in like full strength, full speed in India. And now they are like, going to do everything they can to reach a two digit uh, uh, growth rates. So I would put it into this kind of historical context and look, look at class interests. And, uh, but why? Yeah. I see a lot of like. Very interesting ideas in India. It's always a, a disappointment that like, there is not much uh, forefront in the, in the political discourse. <laughs> Kate, Kate um, I think she would definitely be a, a post-growth thinker. Uh, I say post-growth because it's a little bit broader than degrowth. If you take post growth, it includes A growth. A growth is like agnostic about growth. You know, let's set the targets and whether it grows or not, it's not important. Uh, uh, she's sometimes very sympathetic to D growth. Uh, post growth also includes the steady state, right? The idea that like, we, we should reach we should reach an ongoing economy. Why why would always be why would we always stay in this Chinese? Uh, like st state of growth, we need to reach some kind of maturity, but then the, the problem is like at what level? So she might not use the word explicitly, I don't think she does. I'm not a full specialist of her work, but uh, she is constantly uh, cited by people's authors and she's very much present in those debates, so I would like totally classify her there. And the democracy one. I think this one is for Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> democracy and growth. I don't know if we have time. <laughs> but very, very briefly, democracy and growth. Oh God. I think they are already decoupling because we have growth without democracy. So there is a way in which the first quick answer is it is no longer working. What has worked for a while is no longer working, that, that, and we're still longing for something which is no longer there, so we need to imagine and envision radical alternative about the market, and that cannot be brief, and I'm not saying that now, but, you know, the whole, the big, big, big fight between Carboline on the one hand and Hayek on the other, both at the end of the 40s, analyzing the role of the market, and it's, it's a super fast version is, uh, Hayek saying the, the free market and a market society is the only thing that can save us from fascism. So we need to transform. Market is nothing natural. This is neoliberalism, right? Nothing natural. We have to force society into becoming a market society because only the market can save us from fascism. And Colonia on the other side saying unregulated market is what brought us into fascism. Society reacts against a regulated market because it's a threat to social bonds and social relationship. And one of the ways in which society defends itself is fascism. So they have two inter diametrical interpretations. And I am, guess what? On the side of Polanyi, I think he was right. Unregulated market, a global regulated market, is what destroys the social bonds and undermines the possibility of democracy. Which doesn't mean that we cannot have markets local regulated markets where people meet and exchange 
But this is an entirely different thing. With neoliberalism, society is transformed into a market society, and that cannot work. That with democracy, this is a beautiful book by Wendy Brown uh, on neoliberal. I forgot the title, but on, on you know what I mean. Uh, this. And do it the end, in which she analyzes how neoliberalism and undoing destroys the foundation of democracy. And it's a book that I really recommend reading. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh,